controls your mind doesn't like it. It's got your emotions under its control, your feelings, your perceptions, what you like and dislike. It's even skewing and perverting the very word of God trying to make you sign off on your own unclean perversions using the Bible. You're blinded. You're in darkness. We're piercing the darkness. Acts 5. Acts chapter 5. Look here at verse 16. And there came also a multitude out of the cities round about Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them that were vexed with unclean spirits. That were there is numerous unclean breaths. And they were healed, everyone. Look how he always aligns unclean spirits with healing. You know, you got to be healed. Mind, body, soul, and spirit. You got to be healed all through and through. It's a lot of damage they do to you. An unclean breath. Now think about something that could absorb into the human body as wind. That's what spirits are. Spirits are breaths. They're like crispy creatures that come in through what? Wherever there's an air passage. They can come in through your nose, your mouth, your ears, your eyes, your sexual organs the pores of your skin, any opening is seen as a gateway. So they want you to sin with your physical members. To do what? Open a gateway, an entry point. What you look at is a gateway. Your senses, smelling, tasting, touching, hearing, gateway. That's why you can't afford to have an inquiring mind like the commercial tells you about the newspaper. Inquiring minds want to know. If David's butt had never looked at Bathsheba across that rooftop and inquired after her and asked for her to come over there, he'd been a, be uh, he'd been a lot better off. Looking. At a naked behind across the rooftops. Then going back downstairs, uh, does anybody know who lives in that house right across the way there? Oh, yes, sir, yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Uriah's house, yeah. Uh, does he have a wife? Oh, yeah, Bathsheba, but yeah, she lives over there. I'd like to talk to her about Uriah. Tell her to come over. I want to meet with her. First thing she did, took that veil off her head. What that now veil says, I'm a married wo woman under the authority of my husband. When she looked that veil down, she's saying, you want this? You got it. All you got to do is say the word, king, and it's on. Because she parked herself on that rooftop, butt naked, to be seen by him, for him to inquire after her, because she wanted to kill your ride to get the king. She put it all in the king to kill her husband. You don't have a man kill your husband and you marry the guy and have a baby by the guy going down the road with the murderer of your own husband unless you plotted it all out from Jump Street. Don't run that on me. See, that's the behind the scenes story of the Bible. Our carnal mind says, well, I, I don't see all that in the Bible. I know you don't because you can't see it. You know you study the man across the rooftop. Y'all know what y'all used to do in the club. Come on. You know what time the guy walks about 6.15 every night after dinner. It's all a setup. Everybody wants to play. We're not here to play with anybody. You want to play? I suggest the local schoolyard, the playground, or somewhere like that. Las Vegas, you go there to play. Here, we're dealing with the realness of life. So unclean spirits. What's the cause of this oral sex vexation in the church world and around the world? Unclean spirits. Have you doing unclean acts because you got an unclean mind. They bathed your soul with unclean impurities. And now you have an unclean appetite that you're fulfilling by drinking semen, 
lapping up urine, lapping up feces, and menstrual blood, and calling it a sexual expression of love. You know, lady, you're humiliating that man. You're debasing that man. You're taking his dignity away. You're conquering that man because she gets up and you have no respect for that man. You know, man, you're dishonoring that woman. You humiliate that woman. You see her as trash after what she does. And now if you bring it to the light, the participants get angry because they have darkened minds bathed in unclean spirits. If you would just repent, disassociate, and acknowledge your transgression, God would drive off the unclean spirit and give you light and give you life. This is not just truth. It's right. It's not just right. It's righteous. It's not just righteous, it's liberating. It's not just liberating, it will make you holy, without which no man shall see the Lord. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. The unclean are not coming into God's presence. You participate in this, and you are unclean, and you're married to the sodomite, because you look it up in Webster's, Oral sex is oral sodomy. That's the definition of it. Illegal interest into any orifice that's not designed for sexual intercourse is sodomy. The next thing we address in darkness is homosexuality. The reason why so many people don't say anything about homosexuality is because they participate in oral sex. They're the same thing. Both of you are sodomites. You're married to the sodomite as a, part a participant in, in, in oral sex. So you are a sodomite, and so you're not going to say anything to a sodomite because you do the same thing the sodomite does. The Bible says plainly in Romans chapter 2, you, you not only do the same thing, but you have pleasure in them that do them. You're not going to escape this. Repent. John the Baptist cries in darkness. Repent. A voice of one crying in the wilderness, repent, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Bottom line, this is the day of repentance. This is the last call. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You're not going to bring that unclean filth in here. You got folks on Facebook and the internet Arguing the point, making themselves look pitiful, arguing for that which is debased, unclean, filthy, detestable, inhumane. And you argue, saying you're a Christian. Wake up out of the darkness and God will give you light. Homosexuality, Leviticus 19, 28, everybody knows that, don't turn there. The Bible says you shall not lie with a man like you lie with a woman, it is an abomination. Now God is not going to change from an act being an abomination in the Old Testament to it being acceptable in the New. You see how silly that is? What's the real key that you find along the lines of homosexuality? Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, you look at it very carefully and you can see what God is against here. A work of the flesh. Galatians 5, 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, and what? Uncleanness and lasciviousness, which is unbridled passion and desire. Sodomy is unclean. Sodomy is, according to Romans chapter 1, an unnatural affection. See, how can you take something in the Bible, Old and New Testament, and try to justify it? That's insane. That's madness. 
if you have to even go through a long dialogue about it, you're dealing with an unclean spirit housed in a person trying to justify their filth. They justify themselves, most people who claim to be heterosexuals, because they do the same activities as the homosexuals. The Bible says they do the same things. Not only, not only take pleasure, not only do the same thing, but take pleasure in them that do them. So covenants are cut with the demons. You're not going to stand against a demon you're in covenant with. You're not going to do it. What are we called to do? Warn the righteous, warn the wicked. Bring light and life to the situation. Now they have to choose whether or not they want to stay in the cesspool of life or get out of it. But what do they tell you? First thing they'll tell you is what? It's none of your business. What another person does in the privacy of their own bedroom. Well, if none, it's none of your business if I say something about it. If you, do, if you use that logic. Well, mind your own business. I'm going to say something about it, so mind your own business like you told me to. Free speech, right? Guess what they're going to do? Guess what the sodomite mind will do? It's not free speech now. It's hate speech. You made the homosexual jump off of a bridge by what you said. No, the demons made him jump off of the bridge because he wouldn't let him go and repent. Had he repented, he wouldn't have jumped off the bridge. The demons might have jumped off the bridge without him, but he wouldn't have jumped with them. You only have two choices when the gospel is presented. You can repent and let the demons go, or the anger and malice of the demons in you in covenant with them will make you go. Either the demons, will, the demons are going to leave with or without you. In covenant with them, you go with them. Next thing you know, you out there a lesbian, homosexual, drug addict, a Jehovah Witness, something other than what God requires because you went with the demons. My thing is, man, let the demons go. You stay, let the demons go. We're not called to try to wash the demons off and leave, let you go. We're called to wash the demons out of your soul and you stay and be changed into a normal person. Everything I'm describing is abnormal. Sodomy, all these different illicit sexual activities are all abnormal because it's, it's, it's being put forth by unclean spirits. You know what people will tell you about what I just said? That's my opinion. That ain't my opinion. That's the word of God. I have no opinion. I believe what God said. I don't have an opinion about it. I just believe it. Folks hate that when they participate in activities with unclean, invisible numerous spirits that they've invited into their lives and they actually are entertained by those people and places and things that make the spirit stronger. So the entertainers they ingest are just signing off and entertaining the demons in them. Demons don't sit and watch that which is not like themselves. They won't do it. They entertain by folks to participate in what they like. Sodomites are entertained by sodomites. I don't have an appetite to go to, go to an Elton John concert. I don't want to hear a sodomite sing to me. I don't want to hear nothing he's singing about. I don't care about Benny and any jets. That's over there. This is over here. That's what sanctification is all about. You don't ingest, digest, or partake in that which is unclean because the unclean thing is contaminated by unclean spirits. Don't you know the goal of the devil is very simple? He wants to get inside of you so the Holy Ghost can't. All he's after is blocking up your arteries with the unclean spirits so the Holy Ghost won't come upon you because the Holy Ghost won't flow where unclean spirits are. All the devil has done your whole life is try to contaminate you so the Holy Ghost won't come upon you. Because right. if he does, guess what? The devil's jig is up. He's trying to make us unclean, unapproachable by God, unusable by God, contaminate the houses, contaminate the vessels 
so God's Holy Spirit won't flow through them. That's the whole goal of everything he does. So you have to sanctify yourself, war against the unclean spirits, drive them off, don't faint, don't give up, don't grow weary in well-doing because you're reaping due season if you faint not. Stay in the fight, stay engaged, whatever he does, don't give up, don't fall back, stay in the fight and the struggle until the thing is gone. Yes. And the flesh is mortified and dead. Yes. So he has nothing to use. That's why the apostle says, I stay, I, I stay under this flesh. I beat my body, I buffet it. So the unclean can't use it. That's the made up mind you got to have. I refuse to let the devil into my eye gates, my ear gates. I don't want to talk about this with you. Facebook can contaminate you with crazy folk all day saying all kinds of junk. And your mind begins to think about what they're saying and try to understand them. Some folks, I don't even want to understand what they're talking about because it's too crazy. Get in the word of God. Stay in the word of God. Live in the word of God. Meditate upon the word of God. Bathe in the word of God. Think about the word of God. If it be true, if it be having any good report, if it be have anything of value, any essence of truthfulness, meditate on, think on these things. You can't afford, man, to be distracted away with all these unclean spirits billowing their filth out all day. The next area we'll talk about, we dealt with oral sex, homosexuality. Now here's one that binds people, tithing. You wouldn't think it would be this, this hard. But folks have been drilled and drilled and drilled and over-drilled and re-drilled with a tithing belief that they just won't let go of. Tithing is found in the New Testament in, in 2 Corinthians 9. If you want to know what the New Testament tithe is, you got to read the passage that he's talking about in 2 Corinthians 9. Now, I quote that all the time, but I'm going to read the passage through so you can see it for yourself. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous to, for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind for which I boast of you to them at Macedonia that Achaia was ready, to, ready a year ago and your zeal have provoked very many. Yet have I sent the brothers, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in, the, in the, this behalf, that, that as I said, you may be ready. Lest haply if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in the same confident boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brothers, and they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, Whereof you had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. Now that word bounty there is the word eulogia. We get the word eulogy from it, which is to speak well of. You give a eulogy at a funeral, what you do is you speak well of the dead person. So eulogia is a bounty or speaking well of you. And what he's saying is, you people are coll have collected money for the people of Macedonia. And I'm sending brothers to get the money beforehand so that you'll be spoken well of. The, 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 what you're giving as a, as a selfless person, a selfless body of people, will speak well of you. Then he says this, but this I say, he would sow sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he would sow bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according to purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, with a chip on your shoulder, having to do it, or of necessity, like it's necessary to do it. Why? For God loveth a cheerful, not tither, giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency and all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remains forever. Now, he says, the he that minister seed to the soil, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of what? 
your righteousness. The fruits of your righteousness are found in Galatians chapter 5. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, temperance, and faith. Against such there is no law. Now look what he says in verse 9 there. He says, as it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness remains forever. What's he quoting from? Psalm 112, 9. When you see it is written, look around in the Bible to find out where he quoted it from. Psalm 112, 9. Let's look over there. What's he talking about? It's important to rightly divide the word so you won't be deceived at the end time. This tithing stuff has people just bound, yoked almost totally incapacitated where they feel like if I don't give, man, God's going to curse me. Psalm 112, let's look at the whole thing. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed, blessed is the man that fears the Lord, that delights greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man shows favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil things, evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. He has dispersed, the, he has dispersed, he has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. The wicked shall see it and be grieved. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. It's all about a righteous man. Revering God's commandments. God's going to give you wealth and honor and dignity because you honor his commandments. And you'll have enough to disperse abroad to the poor and give to others as a result. It has nothing to do with tithing. Tithing, where did it come from? Sixth century, century, back in the days of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church began to expand. If you know the history of the church, after the apostles, the bishop, the apostles set up bishops. In the cities, it was organized structure. They had bishops, and the Bible calls the where they govern bishoprics. They were bishops. They were overseers of the church. The apostles died. The bishop in Rome stood up and said, since I'm in Rome, and I'm at the seat of the Roman Empire, I'm the head bishop. And other bishops should be under me. The Greek Orthodox Church was birthed out of the fact that the people in the, in the eastern region, the eastern parts of the Roman Empire, refused to submit to the Bishop of Rome. And they severed from the Roman Catholic Church and became the Greek Orthodox Church. And they actually had another region over there in eastern Rome, the eastern Roman Empire, that had bishops that made up the organized structure over there but the Bishop of Rome rose up as the successor of Peter and claimed to be the vicar of Christ and everything had to flow through me. He became the pontitate, which is actually, actually an offshoot of the word for the actual Caesar. He was the religious arm of the Roman Empire. They amalgamated in all the gods of the Greco-Roman Empire that's where you get Mary as a, as a goddess. That's where you get praying to saints. That's where all that stuff came from. This is historical fact. The churches began to grow, and they didn't have a way to actually manage and administer to the churches because they didn't have enough money. And they sat down and thought up a way to raise money off the folks with a Ponzi scheme. They looked back into the Old Testament and saw tithing. They brought it forward and said, you got to bring 10% into the storehouse for the priest. They called them Roman Catholic priests. So there'll be food in God's storehouse. It was just the Ponzi scheme. Because tithing, check it out for yourself in Deuteronomy, 
was agricultural. You brought food literally to the storehouse so the priests would have food to eat. A tenth of your field was brought so the priests could eat. The New Testament, God sustains ministries, ministers and ministries because he says, don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. The laborer is worthy of his hire. But God generates through his people a spirit of giving to sustain whatever they're being fed by. To sit up and eat of anything and not participate in the actual substance of it or sustaining of it is evil. If I like a restaurant, well, man, I don't mind paying for the food because I'm keeping it open. Because I like these lamb chops they serve here. And I, get, I leave a tip for y'all because, hey, even because I want this to stay open because I like these lamb chops. How is anything going to be sustained if it's not supported by those that participate in it? That's insanity. I don't get on the internet and I don't hang around talking about money all the time because I got to believe that God's got some folks with common sense. That if what we're saying is value in feeding somebody, surely they'll keep the thing open. If not, you're evil. Now you can't say that. I just said it. Because you want to eat on somebody else's dime. I don't care how it stays open. I just want to eat. It's like you call a picnic or something. The only thing that shows up in some people's hands is their hands. The only thing they got under the table are, they, are their size 10 feet eating everything in sight. What did you bring? I brought me and an appetite. The spread is out there. Everybody brought a, a, a covered dish, and all you brought was you to eat. You're evil. Never bring anything to the deal. Never bring anything to the table. Never have a participation in any endeavor. All I come for is to do what? Take from the labors of somebody else. If Jennifer labors in the kitchen and prepares macaroni and cheese, potato salad, she's, she's made jerk chicken, stayed up all night and come to the picnic with three dishes and you show up with nothing and you want to eat all of that food she made, you're eating. At least stop and get some sodas, man. Bring some mustard and ketchup, some condiments. All I've ever done in my life is take, take, take from the labors of another person. And you come to the gospel like that, you come with evil intentions in your heart. That's why you don't have to teach it. The new birth, transformation, sanctification, and you being made over organically will teach you this all by itself. It's unteachable lessons that are germane to life type that you never have to mention to people because the life type bursts it into you. And you know it's righteous to sustain that that feeds you. If it's of, if it's of no value to you, don't eat it and don't sustain it. You see, don't plug into it. If this message has no value, just don't plug into it. Leave it alone. No hard feelings. But don't let other folks labor, labor, labor. Y'all, you do is ingest and eat and get fat on it and have no participation in it. I mean, if book orders come in, Tom pays that. Tom sustains the internet. Dana ships out and Omar ship out books out of their own pockets. Folks do stuff all the time that nobody sees. They're engaged themselves because it's their thing. They don't even tell anybody about it. I know what they do. They know what they do. God knows what they do. But to sit and just ingest and get fat and try to sit around on a prayer line and pray, but you have no participation whatsoever, man, what's wrong? It's something bad wrong with the way you think. There's demonic inspirations in you that makes you a selfish person instead of a selfless person. Even folks who don't have anything, they take on the burden of consistent, continual intercession and prayer. That's their contribution. I don't have any money. I don't have physical, but I stay down, man. I lay before God and labor in prayer for this thing. 
And God sees secretly. He'll reward them openly. That's what the Bible says. Your father who sees you in secret will reward you openly. There's an evil essence in church folk. Not born again folk, church folk. They come around to try to pimp the church and live off the church. Man, get as far away from that spirit as you can because that's an evil, unclean spirit. Tithing is not a New Testament doctrine. I don't care what Creflo says, T.D. Jake says, Kenneth Copeland says, Kenneth Hagen says. I don't care what they say on TBN. I don't care what your preacher said, your mama's preacher said, your dad who is a preacher, what he said. I don't care what anybody taught you. You have been deceived. What is the New Testament doctrine? Romans 12, 1. Present your body as a living sacrifice. That's the New Testament time. You are not part of what you have. All of you. I'm going to prove to you today that, hey, God is not after you giving things and giving all this stuff and trying to participate in a giving, uh, a giving based on tithing. If he gets you in your mind, he's got everything you own. Because he can do what? Orchestrate what you do by being led by the Spirit. There's no resistance to God's will. You give and you do exactly what he thinks for you to do. Because the mind will be a conduit for God's thoughts and you just obey the thinking of God. No resistance. Whatever God wants is fine with me. Nothing belongs to me. He can do whatever he wants with it. To sit up talking about 10% is really an abomination. 10%? After all Jesus Christ has done for you, you're talking about 10% of something. Man, please, you better go somewhere and come again. It's all about giving it all to God and letting God have it. The last thing I'll deal with is the law. Man, you want to see a rope put around folks' neck. The law. Folks will go back to the law over and over again because there's sin in their lives. And by inclination and by instinct, you go into the law when you've got sin in you and sin consciousness. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And so the word for law in the Bible is not really law. It's really laws. You don't live under laws. You can't attain to righteousness by, by observing laws. Laws won't make you righteous. Just because you slowed down because you saw the radar gun out there with the cop holding it, that didn't make you righteous. You just avoided getting caught. He says, 1 Timothy 1, 3, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that, though, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless gene genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying or godly building you up. That, you run into that all the time. People got all these endless questions, endless doctrines, just want to talk all day, but it builds nobody up. He said, Godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is this. What's the commandment after? Charity, which is love, that spews forth from a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. That's the goal of the, goal of the commandment. From which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. Desiring to be teachers of what? Teachers of the law. Understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. So if I tell you homosexuality is an abomination, I'm using it lawfully. Knowing this. Knowing this, knowing this, like Derek Pritchard was always saying, knowing, when you see knowing this in the Bible, you can be assured that most times people don't know it. Knowing this, 
that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind. What's he talking about? What I just talked about a minute ago, the oral sex, the anal sex, the bestiality, the homosexuality. You defile yourself with mankind. For men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. The law is not made for a righteous man. So if you're righteous, you don't need laws. What has replaced and displaced the law? Romans chapter 8. The law of Moses, the law, the law found in Deuteronomy and Numbers and Leviticus has been displaced and replaced by this law found in Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, the fallen human nature, but after the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh, in Jesus' flesh. That the righteousness of the law. See, the law is after righteousness. But it couldn't achieve it because of what? The flesh. It ain't the law that's the problem. It's the nasty flesh that can't do it. So God condemned the flesh in Jesus' flesh by crucifying the Adamic nature and giving us the spirit to walk in the spirit to do by nature what commandments couldn't achieve. So don't talk to me about homosexuality being all right and oral sex being all right because we walk in a higher standard than the law. It didn't lower it. It raised the standard. The Spirit, who is called the Holy Spirit, is a higher standard than the law. He absorbed the law into himself and raised the standard to holiness now. Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It doesn't downgrade you to enjoy or participate in things outside of the old covenant. It absorbed right into the law of the spirit and changed your nature so you won't want to do what he commanded you not to do in the old covenant. I don't desire to do it anymore. I've had people come to, to me claiming to be saved and ask me, what do I have to stop doing? Well, let me ask you a question, preacher. Can I preach? Can I, can I smoke? Yeah. I tell you, yeah, you can smoke. Can you drink? Can you drink a lot of liquor? You can drink all the liquor you want. Can I go to the strip joint? Yes. Can I lie? Yes. Steal? Yes. Fornicate? Yes. Commit adultery? Yes. So what do I have to stop doing? Nothing. It's about your nature. It's not what you can or cannot do. It's what you don't want to do anymore. I have no desire to go to the strip joint. I have no desire to listen to their music. I have no desire to watch their stinking, filthy TV shows and movies. I have no desire to curse. Some of you used to curse like proverbial sailors. You didn't just decide to stop cursing. It was washed out of your system by another nature. It's all about a nature change. So if you have to spend all that time trying to explain to somebody claim to be saved why they can't do a filthy, unclean thing, you know what they need? You need to be born again of the Spirit of God. Then you need to be sanctified by the Spirit of God and filled by the Spirit of God. And the question will go away. 
We're burning a lot of fuel trying to get ranked sinners to see spiritual things that they participate in and still enjoy. You're wasting time. You're burning fuel. Don't cast your pearls before swine. They don't like me saying this because they see it as an affrontery. Well, I'm saved. No, you ain't. You don't have the right to judge me and tell me I'm not saved. Yes, I do. He that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. The Bible commands us to judge. Read Corinthians. You got folks going before unclean, ungodly folks to go to court. Say, you can't judge the folk in the church amongst yourselves. You go before the judges out there when you should be judging each other within the church. And yet you go before unsaved, unregenerate people to bear out judgment against each other. So, man, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of you. I'm ashamed of you. What y'all doing? You see, it's a difference between the clean and the unclean. Your dirty dishes don't sit with your clean dishes. It's, they're sanctified from the unclean. Everybody's not the same in this. That's not exclusiveness. That's not trying to be a cult. That's not trying to be somebody that's high-minded and legalistic. Everybody's not the same in this. That's why he says if you separate or purge yourself from these, the vessels fit for dishonor, you'll be a, ma a, a vessel complete and fit for the master to use. What you have with the young people in church a lot of times? They're bathed in the spirits of the world. They dress like them, walk like them, talk like them, look like them. And they're trying to make you bring down God to the level of where we accept that and say, well, that's okay because they're young. No, it ain't. You got to change like everybody else. That filth you're ingested from the world, the fashions designed by homosexuals in New York, Paris, and London have you looking crazy and you need to change. Normalcy is always defined by the participants therein. Jesus said, look, John the Baptist came. He wasn't eating. He wasn't drinking with you. He wasn't having anything to do with you. He was an isolated man, sanctified man, coming out of a wilderness with locusts in one hand and wild honey in the other. He didn't pipe for you. He didn't sing any songs to you. You said he has a devil and he's crazy. I came eating, drinking, I came fellowshipping. I was eating with the harlots, eating with all these unclean sinners. I was with everybody every day in the streets, laying hands on folks, casting out devils, eating in your house, even the Pharisees' houses. I was with the tax collectors. I didn't ostracize the woman at the well who had all those husbands and laying around and fornicating and all she was doing. I was right there with you. And what did you say about me? A stinking wine bibber and a sinner. Then he added this, but wisdom is justified of her children. You're going to see it like you want to see it and sign off on what you are based on how you see it to justify what you're doing. You will modify this Bible to justify your sin because you don't want to break covenant with those unclean spirits. And you stand in folks' faces looking like somebody crazy trying to justify your filth quoting the Bible. You better go somewhere and come again because the saints ain't buying it. Folks don't like that. Too bad. It's the way it is. So you see here, that we walk in the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, a higher standard than the Old Testament law. Don't downgrade it. Don't do what this guy was doing to me, talking about I want to see line and verse as to why you can't tattoo yourself. Why you can't tattoo yourself? Leviticus 19.28. What does it say? Don't mark your body like the heathen does. NIV, don't tattoo your body. They say you tattoo your body for the dead. Now, here's what the whole gist of everything I'm saying revolves around. You take everything I said, including the thing about tattooing. You have people debating whether or not you can get a tattoo. That's, how, that's what we've degraded to. Romans 12.1 says to do what? Present your body as a living sacrifice, holding itself to the God, which is your reasonable service, 
Don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind to prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. 1 Corinthians 6. Let's look at that and read through that. This is interesting right here. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, good buddy, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. He goes to that abuser of themselves with mankind, again, trying to let you know something. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But, now here's where you separate from the person that's a nominal Christian and somebody trying to convince you that sin is okay. But you are washed. But you are sanctified. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it, the meat, and it, the belly, and them, the meats. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God has raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. <coughs> no, excuse me. Know you not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know you not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. For he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee. Run away from fornication. Every sin that a man does is without the body, but he that commits fornication sins against his own body. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's property. How in the world do you have any say so as to what God does with his property. I wrote it out to the guy on the internet. He couldn't see it for nothing in the world. I said, if you gotta, if you, if God, you, if God has, has received your body according to Romans 12, 1, if he says in 1 Corinthians 6, 13, that your body belongs to the Lord and the Lord is for your body, if he says right here in, in 1 Corinthians 6, 20, that you've been bought with the price and you're not your own, the body and the spirit is God's, where are you going to get a body to tattoo? You don't have one. That's the answer. You don't have a body to tattoo. You don't have a body to pierce. You don't have a body to do anything with illicit. You don't have a body if you're a Christian. That's the separator between the nominal Christian that's faking and the real Christian that's been justified, been washed, been sanctified, been done all these things to in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God in, in, in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. That's the difference. When they try to say we're all the same, we all have sin. Nobody listen to me. I have been washed. I have been sanctified. I have been justified, which means just as if I never sinned in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Everybody's not a sin conscious person. Everybody's not a participant in sin. I've stopped. I repented and turned away. All of us are sinners. No, you're a sinner. You, you lay claim to that. For a saint is just a sinner that fell down and got up. No, he's not. A saint is somebody that ceased from sin, yes. repented and turned, and is being sanctified unto righteousness and holiness, not desiring to participate in any sin any longer. And that gives us the wherewithal and the authority to preach against it. Because yes. I came out from amongst them. 
I touch not the unclean thing. God has received me unto himself, and he says he deals with me as a son and a daughter. I will be your God, and you shall be my people. And they don't like the authority of this. They don't like the absolute proclamation of it. They want you to come down and stop saying it because I have not stopped participating in sin. That's a witness against you. Because the Bible says, David speaking, God against you and you only have I sinned. You can't pull another person into your mess and justify you being in it. Confront somebody with sin. The first thing they try to do is microscopically examine you. That, won't, that just means me and you going to hell together if I'm sinning. All you did was damn me and you. You didn't pull you out of it. You just pulled me into it. You see how stupid that is? I'm looking for somebody that's not doing it. I'm looking for somebody that's going to help me pull me out of this, this mess and this hell hole I'm living in. I'm, I'm down there swimming in sewer water. Can you pull me out? I don't want somebody in the sewer water with me. Pull me out. Pull me up. Raise me up. Raise the standard. So we all have to attend to the higher standard, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I want to stay down here growling around in sewage, man. We're trying to move up. Even the slaves wanted to get to the big house. I'm down in the field picking cotton. At least in the big house, I'm a waiter. In, in, in cold winter nights, they got a fireplace. I hear in the shed, y'all just sitting around in here trying to rub up two sticks together to stay warm. In the big house, the master got all kind of logs and stuff. But you still a slave. You yell, I'm in the big house. I ain't, I ain't one of y'all. Everybody's trying to move up higher. Every time God calls somebody in the Bible, he always says, do what? Come up higher. I went up to Sinai to see God. You don't ever see somebody going down to no valley to meet God. He's trying to raise folks up. Come up. He didn't pull Ezekiel down by a lock of his hair to show him anything. He pulled them up. Man, get up. Go up. Move up. Rise up. Bring up. Jesus didn't descend. He descended first, but then he ascended. The only reason he went down, the Bible says, that he might feel all things. He descended first, then ascended, that he might feel all things. All power has been given unto me, both in heaven, in earth, and under the earth. I even rule hell. I have authority on who goes and who doesn't go. You can't get around the Lord. So what I'm saying is very simple. You don't want this darkness to bathe your mind and don't let people in darkness try to bring you into the darkness to subdue you. Man, I walk in light. I walk in life by nature. You're in darkness. You need to come over here. What the final proclamation of the ages will be is this. If you want to be saved, you've got to come over here because we're not coming over there. We're not downgrading this thing, not one hour older for anybody. You see a man, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. There's a man here. I believe it to be Paul, but it doesn't really say. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, it is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knows. Such an one called up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows how that he was caught up into paradise. Remember Jesus said on the cross, today shall you be with me in paradise. You got to get a heavenly vision, man. I believe this drove Paul. I've been up there. What y'all thinking about and, and, and theorizing about, I've seen it, man. He said, I was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, 
or that he hears of me. That's why I think it's him because he went back to talking about himself. Going up to the third heavens. Now here's the point I'm trying to make. We're piercing the darkness. We live in the first heavens, the seen celestial dome, including the solar systems. If you, if you move, your, if your spirit was to disembark on a journey from here, it would lift up. Go through the solar systems, and even in outer space, the scientists will tell you there are dark holes. No light in the holes. They don't know what that is. It's possible that those dark holes are the portholes in the devil's second heavenly realm where there's utter darkness and no light. As you go through there, you go through the valley of the shadow of death where you fear no evil because the Lord is escorting you through. Thou art with me. You break through that second heavenly into the third where God's throne is and paradise exists. Now, if that be true, we know there are at least three heavens because the Bible says Jesus filled all heavens, all heavens. You can't have two heavens and you, can, and you can't use the word all with two. He would only say he fills both heavens. When you switch it over to all, you must have at least what? At least three. Now, if Paul says he was called up to the third heaven, I believe three is all that there is because I don't believe there's a heaven above God's throne. You know, I mean, I don't know who would be ruling God in the fourth heaven. You know, I think it's in uh, Islam that they talk about seven heavens. You ever heard anybody say, I'm in seven heaven? That comes from Islam. Don't say that. That's, that's Islamic teaching. Like Derek Prince said, you can say I'm on cloud nine because there's more than nine clouds, more than eight clouds. There's not more than nine clouds. I'm on cloud nine right now. You know, I'm just happy. But the seventh heaven, don't go over there because I believe there's just three. The darkness in the second heaven has now extended onto earth in the mind. See, the darkness of the kingdom of darkness, the prince of darkness has extended into man's mind and soul because man has allowed the unclean, filthy spirits of darkness into his mind and soul. And it blinds you with darkness. It's the power Jesus called when he was crucified. This is the power of darkness. It's the ability to actually mesmerize and forecast a device on the mind to hypnotize, to actually divine up darkness on a mind that blinds you that you can't see the king of glory, the Lord from heaven, the deliverer. Here is our Messiah in front of us, and we can't even see him. A sinner, you can sit right in front of a sinner with the words of eternal life on your lips. Their way out is in front of them, and they can't even see you, can't hear you, Blinded by the prince of darkness because they haven't broken covenant with their own sin. And if the light in them be darkness, the Bible says, how great is that darkness. If I see that world changes and receive the messages of darkness from Preflo Dollar, and I receive this revelation from God, I'll fight my own liberation from that message. And if the light in you be darkness, how great is that darkness? What empowers the darkness? The numbers of people sitting there. I, it's got to be right. Look how many people sit here under it. That proves nothing. Numbers are insignificant to God. Broad is the way that leads to damnation. Many there be that go in there at. Narrow is the way to eternal life. And few there be that find it. Numbers are usually against you. The masses believe the lie. The fewer number come to the truth. Because the truth requires what? My death. I got to come by way of the cross. Death works in me, he says, right? So that life can be imparted to others. Folks don't want to die to the flesh. They don't want to die to this world. They don't want to die to the spirits of this world. 
I don't want to give up anything. And I want God to sign off on my salvation in spite of me. It won't happen. It will not happen. So that darkness that permeates the sat satanic realm is now in the earth. And if you get enough people in darkness, guess what happens to the earth? It becomes dark. It's about the mind. From the White House to the outhouse, now the world is bathed in darkness. You don't even have a pony in the race for the election this year. You don't even have a candidate in the race as a Christian. Abortionist, homosexual, uh, 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 agreeer, somebody that's trying to promote it, and a Mormon. The Christian is the odd man out. You don't have a pony in the race. I don't. I don't know. I'm. I don't know. Well, you got to vote for the less of two evils. That ain't in the Bible nowhere. Oh uh, yes, except the devil. <laughs> don't accept the devil. Except one of his demons. The less of two evils. That's crazy. God brought it to this. So you give up on politics. Can't you see God is making us give up on everything down here? Educational system, give up. Ain't no hope there. Economy, it's crashed. Forget it. Name something. Everything leaves you. And you come to the conclusion, you know, there's no hope in this life. I try to tell folks over and over again, the best you can hope for is Westview Cemetery. Every time you bring up something, it's going to end at Westview Cemetery. I just got married. Well, you and your husband are going to die. I just had a baby. You and the baby are going to die too. Now my mama, she just uh, came back from Europe. Your mama going to die. Name somebody. They're going to die. It's a hopeless endeavor. The things that are seen are temporal. The things that are not seen are eternal. They're deathless and everlasting. God makes no apology for the temporal, temporal things of life. He didn't desire it to be permanent. Because if it doesn't leave you, you will leave it. And you know what people call that? Doom and gloom. Negative. All you preach is doom and gloom. Death. Because I don't want to process my own death. Because I'm not ready to die. Because I don't know the Lord. And I'll be damned. So you think that ignoring it is going to make it better? When tomorrow's not promised to anybody? Come on, man. You don't have a future here. Get degrees. Get a master's. Get a doctorate. There's a lot of folk at Westview with those. Beautiful girl. Oh, she's so beautiful. A lot of beautiful folk at Westview. He's a handsome fella. You know, he's a, man, he's a, man, look at that, that build on that guy. He's a built-up fella, too. I can show you a plot right at Westview that has a built-up guy in it. Glory in anything in the flesh. Yeah, but they're going to die. Marilyn Monroe was beautiful. Marilyn Monroe was dead. John Kennedy was a great president. You know John Kennedy is dead. Name somebody. Name a Bible character. You know David's dead. Joseph is dead. Moses is dead. Everybody's dead. Why do Christians see that as negative? Because they still love the world. They haven't let go of it. All your life, through fear of death, you will subject yourself to bondage, slavery, trying to make this work when it's built into the system that it cannot work because you got to die. The sooner you process that, the sooner you'll be made free. I'm not here forever. I'm just passing through. And the faster you get saved and begin to serve the Lord, the faster you get free and your life takes on a meaning. There's no meaning to life outside of salvation. 
So you get, you, you're always searching for something to do. Fun. Parties. Always on the phone. What's everybody doing tonight? 